Good morning. Welcome to Sunny Can. Hello. Um, my name is Andy Edwards, and I'm going to be uh, moderating this panel today, which is how the uh, new generation does business, is, is what we've titled it. Just to give you a little bit of background um, on why I'm here, um, for the last 18 months or so, I've been chairing a group in the UK music industry called Futures. And that was put together by a body called UK Music, which represents all the various different strands of the music industry in the UK, lobbies the government, speaks to the media and so forth on collective issues that are important to everybody. Uh, and what we felt was perhaps lacking a little bit in that organisation, what we wanted to address was to talk to a younger generation of executives, executives in their 20s and early 30s coming into the industry and getting a sense of what was important to them and where they saw the industry going. This was people across all sorts of job roles, from A&R to marketing, lawyers, agents, promoters, and so forth. And out of that stemmed the idea from this panel, and that's why we're here today. And what we've done is we've brought together a group of people from across the global music industry uh, who can give us a bit of a perspective of, of what they're seeing and where they think the industry is going to go. So let me introduce everybody to you. Uh, first of all, Ebony Haley. Hi, so Ebony, uh, tell, us, uh, tell everybody where you're from and what you do. I'm from born and raised in Los Angeles, California. I am the conference program director of the Revolt Music Conference um, of Revolt TV, Sean Puff Daddy Combs um, channel, network, and I manage his three-day conference in Miami. Great, okay. Um, and uh, Alison Chenyu? Hi, um, so Alison, I was born in France. I've got a bit of a crazy journey and then I traveled to South Africa where I met an artist called Toya the Lazy, who I managed since um, 2013 now. Um, and we're now based in the UK where we launched a project over there in London. And Aman Amanda Maxwell. Uh, hello, um, I'm Amanda Maxwell. I work over at the online music platform Boiler Room, and I'm also part of the community She Said So, as well as managing a DJ and artist. Right. And uh, lastly, Andrea Magdalena. Hi everyone, firstly, thanks for being here so early. <laughs> uh, my name is Andrea, I am the founder of She Said So, and I also do a bunch of other freelance things in the music tech space. Okay, so Andrea, I'm just gonna start off with you. So you've, how long have you been in the industry now, would you say? Ooh, don't put me on the spot there. <laughs> I think it's been maybe seven years now. Okay, Yeah. and you kind of came in, you've been sort of predominantly in the tech space, so you're working at Mixcloud, that's how I got my my start in music. I was previously in the startup world, very passionate about tech, kind of wanted to become a geek and geek out on UX and development stuff, but then music pulled me on the other side and I've done artist relations kind of stuff, kind of work for them, and then moved to LA, convinced them it's a good idea for them to set up shop there, did that for a bit, and then pivoted again, had a few experiments with a few other music tech companies, and now I'm, I guess, a consultant through various agencies. I do brand partnerships for like Microsoft and, and Skype, um, and I do product management for a couple of other clients uh, through another agency called Wondersauce. That's more of a standard kind of digital agency. So one of the things that's interesting, I think, about your journey, because you were coming into the industry just as streaming was starting to become you know, a big reality. It wasn't quite the thing that it is today, but it was just starting to come through. So tell me about your observations, you know, coming into the, the music industry with fresh, eye, fresh eyes. What, you, what did you feel was good about the industry? What did you feel was bad? Well, to your point, actually, that was a pretty good one. Uh, when I first started working with Mixcloud, I think that was 2010 or something like that. Streaming was just starting to pop off. Spotify was only beginning to, like I remember I had a Spotify account for free for ages because I was a student. They were running this whole program back then. It wasn't even present in the US at the time. And um, the SoundCloud was kind of booming. And obviously Mixcloud was always put in comparison to SoundCloud. And I, was, I had a difficult job to go around and explain to people why it's important to uh, stream music that's licensed so that it goes back to, to the artist and the whole idea behind royalties and, and so on. So it was, it was quite interesting to, to then witness the switch mm -hmm. um, and now streaming has fully been embraced by the industry and it's kind of positively impacted did, did it. Did you feel it was quite a tough conversation initially? Were people open to what you were doing or, or not? 
I think people were always open, but you know, it always came down to okay, but I'm getting two million plays on SoundCloud and I'm not getting any plays on Mixcloud, even if those plays um, on a platform like Mixcloud would have accounted towards, you know, more royalties back. Okay. It was just like that whole thinking wasn't really there yet. And then okay. with the advent of Spotify, that kind of started clicking in people's heads that mm -hmm. those streams equal money. Okay. So yeah, that was very interesting. Okay. And so Ebony, tell me about your first role in the industry what, and what your first impressions were. Um, I'm still fairly new. I've been uh, working at Revolt and for Mr. Combs and Andre Harrell for the last five years. So um, my initial reaction was that there's the artists are becoming a lot more colorful, um, literally, <laughs> in their hair, in their teeth, in their jewelry. On their, it's it, the the climate is definitely changing from a more lyrical artist to a more like poppy whoever can get radio play with a catchy hook kind of artist. Mm -hmm. So I'm noticing that shift in, and it's like, we're all dragging our teeth and really embracing that. Mm -hmm. But it's what, it's the things we have to play on the network. It's, it's the artists who are making the noise, the, the artists who are on the charts, even if they're on the charts for like the, the one single that, that goes hot and then you don't hear about them anymore. Um, we, have to, we have to pay attention to those people. And that's been pretty difficult because at Revolt, or even me, you just want to really get into hip hop and you want to understand the lyrics and the history of it. And it's really hard to um, to embrace the here today, gone tomorrow artists, but they do have a fan base and you have to pay attention to that. Sure, okay. And before you came into the industry properly in terms of you know a job, had you sort of been paying much attention to the industry? Is it was, was it something you wanted to get into or did you just fall into it? No, uh, uh, my background is in human resources and operations, honestly. and. So I've always been in industry relations or artist relations, but not really in television and in music. And it really just like, I was able to impress my boss um, on enough projects where he was like, go put together the conference. And it really just threw me in there. Like, I, I'm gonna be honest, I don't have like years and years of experience. I just, I just got into this okay. five years ago. Now you've got an MBA as well. So you know, do. you've, you've done all of the things that you would hope to do in a, you know, that, that would take you into, I don't know, maybe a conventional corporate career. Absolutely, my ba bachelor's in human resources, my master's in organizational development. So this is, it, it, fit, it fit in terms of the business, but mm -hmm. music is about the relationships. And unfortunately, a lot of my degree that I was so comfortable with in a corporate world does very little to help me in the music industry. Right because it's about who you know and, and the information you know. And I know corporate stuff. I know how to put a business plan together, which helps mm -hmm. around, especially in the music industry where there's so many creatives. So it's helping, I'm becoming the balancing partner to a lot of artists. And how did you find sort of managing or working with big personalities? I don't, I don't, <laughs> I, don't. Um, I let them be that big personality like you, you, you I have learned, especially in the music industry, as a woman, as a minority, as a millennial, to just listen first and then speak. If, if what I'm saying is worth speaking, like you, you speak when you have something to say in front of these people. Mm -hmm. And if you just want, like it's not the industry and I'm not working around the people who, who just, you just want to be heard, you just want to say something. You don't speak unless you have something to say right. and you mostly listen. Like I'm humble enough, you listen. If you don't know what you're talking about, if you don't know the information, you're quiet because very quickly, if you speak your opinion, someone's like, okay, what, like they're picking, they're chomping at the bit to like Got tear it. everything you're saying down. So I don't speak unless I really know what I'm talking about or I have a solid opinion because the, the men, the egos, even the women that I work with, they're used to being heard. They're used to hearing yes. They're used to hearing that everything they think and say is the most amazing thing on earth. So <laughs> I just, I just. Um, Some good points there. We're gonna come back to the male ego thing a little bit later on. Um, but Alison, I want to bring you in now. So you've had a very interesting career. You started out in sports and sports marketing and you've kind of gravitated into music. Tell us about that journey and tell us about, you know, what you liked and disliked about sports and, and, and coming into the music industry, what your first impressions were. <clears throat> yeah, so um, I studied um, entertainment and media management at um, university, so I've got a master's in that. Where um, um, I really studied the whole aspect of entertainment, which is like running events and dealing with sponsorship and partnerships, and obviously law and contracts are very important in this industry. 
So I went into sports because I was passionate about sports. Um, and then I was lucky enough to um, go to South Africa for the World Cup, working with FIFA. And that's when I met um, actually an artist called Toya, as I said earlier on, um, South African artist. And um, we, we just became friends at first. And I was helping her with the contracts. She was getting signed with Sony, um, big deals, you know, so big contracts. I was helping her really to support her because she didn't have that background in, in business. So I really wanted to, to help her and, and support in that journey. And, um, and yeah, I mean, just working day to day on, on this helping her, it just happened naturally where okay. I became a manager. And, and how did, you, I mean, did you feel equipped when you made those first steps? Not really, steps? Okay. not really. I mean, it was, I learned a lot. I, I learned on the go, mm -hmm. but um, I think as young managers, we just have to to go for it and just learn as we go. You know, it's not written in a book or to manage a famous artist. Right. You know, there's there's no manual for it. So working with major labels and major label executives can be quite an intimidating thing, particularly when you're coming into the industry for the first time. How did you deal with that? It was not easy um, sitting in a in a boardroom with a bunch of. Um, like 50 years old guys, you know, standing mm -hmm. up there and I've got no experience. I come from a sports background. Right. So it's like, it was not easy, but, um, you know, I, I can read contracts, I can read numbers. So it was just numbers talking, you know, so at the end of the day and mm -hmm. we, we all understood each other and yeah, that's how so it So you worked. kind of focused on the facts. Yeah, more on the facts. Much. And then now that I've got more experience in the music industry for like, I've been now for six years in the music industry. Um, I've learned a lot more about dealing with relationships and mm -hmm. building a network and, and more than facts, you know, it's more of, a, of right. a relationship. Have you had any mentors or people that you can turn to for advice? Or? Yeah, definitely. Um, when um, I started Toya, she was previously managed by someone called Anthony Morgan, mm -hmm. um, American manager, used to work with Brian McKnight, like very, very knowledgeable person and he learned, I learned a lot from him. Okay. Yeah. Okay, it's good to have people like that around. <laughs> Definitely. Brilliant. I'm going to bring Amanda in now. So, Amanda, tell us about your route into the industry and what your first impressions were. Uh, my route into the music industry isn't very linear at all. Um, I went to University of Lincoln, uh, did a media, culture and communications degree, came out of that. Unfortunately, when I finished university, I thought I was going to be able to move to London with the pipe dream of pursuing my music career. But actually, my mum got taken really sick. So I actually had to just go home and just get a normal job. Um, nothing in relation to my degree, really. It was at a VW service desk as an advisor um, and did that for a couple of years and took care of the family household and my little sister that was studying at the time. Um, that all died down. And then in the end, I just decided that I'd had enough one day of looking at exhaust pipes and MOT papers and things like that. Um, so I quit my daytime job and moved to London um, I then didn't have a job or anything like that. All I knew is that I wanted to get into music. Um, I loved events. I loved being around people. I loved interaction with people. So I just moved on the whim and hoped that something would come across. Um, I worked at an exhibition space at the Excel Center, um, handing out toothpaste <laughs> uh, for 10 hours at a time, which was an interesting um, day to say the least. Um, and then from there I went to work in an ice sculpture business and after being asked to make, I don't know, maybe 30 or 40 rounds of tea a day, I was like, after maybe six months, I kind of lost, lost, my, um, lost my head a bit and got asked by somebody what it is that I really wanted to do and luckily that person introduced me to somebody that worked at Vice magazine and then from there, I did an internship. Luckily for me, Boiler Room were in the same office, saw how I was working, saw my interactions, and it kind of went from there. So tell us about Boiler Room. What does mm. Boiler Room do, and, and what's your role there? So Boiler Room is an online music platform for DJs and artists. We have an HQ over in London. We have uh, freelance people over in New York, and over in Australia, and over in Berlin. Um, and it's an online streaming platform that started with DJs in one of our old office spaces, literally stuck up on the wall and has now transcended to, yeah, us just traveling absolutely everywhere to every single cre crevice of the world. Um, and it's gone, yeah, I mean, it's pretty incredible. It started off very organic and now it's reaching over, like, I think we've got two and a half million likes on Facebook and okay. a million and a half YouTube subscribers. So yeah, it's a, br a 
pretty big up so, there. So one of the things, and uh, Amanda, I, I know quite well, the, the rest of you have only sort of met fairly recently, but over the last year or so, you've been massively helpful to me <laughs> in putting together this Futures Group in the UK because you seem to know absolutely everybody. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, I think tell, <laughs> tell us about that. How, how, how come you're so popular? How come everybody knows you? <laughs> um, I think my way that I like to interact with people so there's a couple of things. First of all, my mum always brought me up to treat people how I'd like to be treated. And I found that this industry can be quite a daunting experience when you're trying to step into the whole experience. It's really easy to forget that you're a human as well as wanting to enjoy a really amazing industry. So I guess that's how I try and interact with people. So what you see is what you get. Um, I like to have open and honest conversation ab about things. Um, and I like to see people have a good time. So for me personally, that's just kind of how I work. Okay. Can I quickly chip in here oh. and shout Amanda out because she said so wouldn't be where it is without her. She's joined for a few for a couple of years now and yeah, she's massively contributed to its growth. So Yay. Thank you. Amanda. <laughs> okay, so let's talk about she said so. So Andrea, you actually helped start that. Obviously Amanda's been instrumental to it in the UK. Tell everybody in the room who might not know what it is and Actually, let's ask people, how many people know what She Said So is about? Quite a few. Good. Yeah, me too. That's nice. But for, for those who don't, just kind of give us the, the quick summary about what, what She Said So is, and then also tell us why you founded it in the first place. Yes, I love telling this story. So She Said So is a global community of women who work in music, uh, predominantly women behind the scenes, uh, not as much artists, because we wanted to keep the community kind of organic and not promotional. Um, so fast forward since 2014, it's been almost four years since we got started. We have about 3,000 women in the community worldwide, about 14 active chapters. That means a different, um, I guess, active community in each city, including LA, New York, London, Bay Area, Toronto, South Africa. Um, it kind of changes between uh, Jayburg and, and Cape Town. Uh, India, Berlin, Paris, I'm forgetting a few, but you get it, it's quite, it's quite it's global. It's grown incredibly quickly, but mm -hmm. what, was, what was the thing that kind of s fired you up to get, get, get it started in the first place? Why did you do it? It's been, it's been something on my mind, to be honest, working at the intersection of music and tech. I noticed that both industries were kind of struggling on a diversity level and female representation particularly, and qu quite honestly, I was put in certain situations in my company at Mixcloud, I was the only woman in the team, of course. Um, majority of them were, you know, on the tech side of things. In the meantime, Mixcloud developed to be more of a, we'll have a stronger kind of brand partnerships arm, which comes with marketing, which comes with, I guess, more diversity and representation on that side of things. But the technical side of any industry typically attracts few women, and I'm not gonna go into why. But basically it was one, meeting, very frustrating meeting that I went to one night uh, with a very big media conglomerate in the UK. Uh, I went with my boss, both of us kind of, you know, unusual for that kind of boardroom, as you were saying, Alison, you know, we were surrounded by suits and we were kind of there to disrupt what they've been doing for the past few decades. Um, and at that meeting, I felt like I'm so voiceless. I, you know, I wasn't even looked in the eyes. I, made, I was made to feel so small. And it just wasn't, yeah, it wasn't great. And I noticed that kind of happens. And I was wondering, is, is it just me? Or is this actually happening to everyone so out there? Alison, let me bring you in there. Does that sound familiar to you? You're very familiar, yeah, completely. Like that whole boardroom suits and, and being made, made felt very worthless, you know? So you're an artist manager now. An artist manager can be quite a lonely existence. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, at, at the, the best of the times. But as as a woman, yeah, managing it, managing an artist, working with labels, promoters, and so forth. Mm. You know, how have you dealt with that? How, and what changes have you seen? Have you seen any positive changes in terms of how people react to you and so forth? Or yeah, definitely. Yeah, because I've built a network now. Like I'm not I'm not alone. You know, we work with booking agents, we work with publicists, we work with PR and and, um, and um, social media, etc. So I've got a team around me. Obviously, it's not it's not the same as it used to be before. I guess where people were all working in an office. I'm now working from home, and I work with freelancers from all over the world, where we 
we we are a team basically, but we just in in different sure. parts of the world. But to, so. but to speak to Andrea's point, you know, as a woman, you're going in and you're having a meeting in a label where maybe it's predominantly men in the meeting. Yeah. You know, just making sure that you feel that you're getting your points across, that they're taking you seriously, that they're hearing what you're saying and acting upon it. What has been your kind of strategy to? Mm, I don't know. I think I just come with with the facts. Like for example, if I come to to a meeting and um, it was the case at the time where um, with, with Sony, um, it was a 360 deal I was dealing with, uh -huh. and um, they had pulled the management side of the 360 deal, so it was very much of a passive deal at the time. Yep. Where um, it it was not working, you know, and I just had to come in there and be like, look, guys, it's it's, it's very nice, you know, it, it worked well for until now, but if you don't pull the efforts and um, you still want to take a 25% chunk of the deal from all aspects of um, the, the artists, I mean, all um, sort of revenues, it, it can't work this way. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you just have to be strong and 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 look at them in the eye <laughs> and, and just make them understand that it, it's not right, you know, and, and what can they say, really? Sure, I mean. okay. So, Ebony, let's come to you now. So you, you, you work in the, in the hip-hop world and you work with some pretty big names. How have you found it as a young woman coming into that environment and navigating your way through? Um, <clears throat> frustrating a lot at times, um, but it has been also, um, I've learned a lot in, in a lot of women, men too, they empower you. They empower the, their team, their team, their, you know, people up under them. They empower them with the information. They, they let them be heard. Um, but for the most part, it's just been really eye-opening that women and millennial again um, are just uh, very much disregarded. Their opinions are disregarded. Unfortunately, the music that is being played, it's from people who look and sound like me, but the decisions that are made are it's the opposite, that are making the decisions about the money, about their artist plan. And so why do you think they're being disregarded? What, what do you think is behind that? I think a lot just ignorance. They assume like they paid their dues, quote unquote. They've been in the industry 20, 30 years. So, of course, they know what they're talking about. And I don't. And um, just just ignorance. But it's it's OK. I, I like the look on their face when I prove them wrong. So. That's good. <laughs> so and what else kind of frustrates you? What really kind of annoys you about some of the things that you, you see? Um, what really annoys me is that uh, the women in the industry, they a lot of them, instead of like pulling up the younger generation of women executives, it's they really hold on to the, their positions and their shine. And, and so you would think all this women empowerment, but I feel like sometimes women empowerment is a platform that people stand on so they can be seen as different, but then behind the scenes, they're maybe not so pleasant to their female assistant or to their, the press person or whomever. Um, that's probably the most frustrating is that the women are that I've come across, they are not as encouraging as I would expect. Right, and are we talking about women of an older generation? Here? Correct. Right, so women within your peer group, Correct. Are, are they kind of more amenable? Do you feel more supported? I do, um, I do feel more supported because it's kind of like this um, hit like under, unspoken humor that we have like oh they underestimate us like we're but we think we're the bomb you know what I'm saying like <laughs> like I feel like that is like silent power and and it's a lot of invisible people like me like us that are like make that are truly the next wave of a lot of the things you you see and hear on television is those invisible people is those millennials so on the you know on the tv and, and at the bigger panels it's the people you hear about it's scooter braun who's amazing it's these global cmos and all that but they don't really tell you that the majority of their information they're getting is from the people under 30 but they're putting their name on it yeah. they're they're presenting that idea at the big meetings and they look like the geniuses and i'm sure a lot of them are but it's unfortunate that um it's people are not made aware of the force behind these great big names got it and one of the one of the interesting things that scooter braun said in his keynote yesterday was to the people in the room was you know, you, you, your greatest chance of success is going to come from other people like you in your room, i.e. your peers, not kind of schmoozing whoever the, the headline person is. Would you all agree with that? I would absolutely agree. I feel like my peers are more, are the most powerful. We're the, we're the best. Like, we're the best. Um, but I, I do think it's a, it's a time and place, obviously, to learn and be in a position to respect and appreciate the people who have come before us and done a lot of the groundwork, but sometimes it's time to just be quiet and, and let someone else speak. Okay, okay. So, 
coming back to sort of she said so, so it really feels like there's a lot of momentum now, you know, behind the sort of the women in music <coughs> narrative. And obviously one of the things that has happened over the last year, I guess, um, and two hashtags in particular, which have struck fear into a lot of men in the industry, whether they're whether it's targeted them or not, which is, which is hashtag me too and hashtag times up. Now obviously that started with some very serious allegations against specific in individuals, but what it's also done is that it's created a conversation about how men and women engage with one another in the industry. And one of the things that strikes me, and I've, I've worked with organizations over the last year or so where I've been in an office which has been pretty much all female, and I've been maybe the only guy and I've got to tell you, it's been a big eye-opener and a learning experience for me as a man in the industry, and I'm you know, not too old, but not as young as I used to be. Um, so just kind of thinking in general terms, and I'm talking specifically about the general climate of how men and women engage with one another. Um, what do, have you seen and experienced over this past year as this whole subject matter has come up, and how you're relating to guys, maybe things, guys that can do better, you know, just kind of tips and advice that you can talk to, to sort of men in the audience, men watching this, are thinking about, okay, what, how, do I, how do I approach this? Uh, and I'm gonna start with Amanda. Okay. Uh, first of all, it's really nice to see, I think, on the basis that, we, that it's quite obvious that it's an all female identifying lineup, that we've got guys in the room that are coming to listen and be our allies in the room. Um, second of all, I feel like it's been an amazing opportunity for people to find the source and find the courage to talk about experiences that they've had. I think we've um, heard it from a very female-focused perspective, and I think that goes alongside everything that we've been talking about thus far. Um, I think it's really important to discuss it as a re-education for everybody, um, the way that everybody interacts with one another, and that comes from both sides. It's not just males interacting with females, it's how we interact with everybody and how we interact with one another. We're now moving into a new climate of interaction and understanding one another. So I feel like we can't tar people with exactly the same brush. And I think that it's been quite difficult in this whole climate that it feels like it's been a general blanket canvas to a lot of people. And that creates a space where guys don't know what they're doing or how to interact properly. So I'm very cautious that we need to strike a balance and go back to how we understand one another. And also from the other flip side, I should imagine that women haven't been complete saints and there are probably instances where guys have been in precarious situations or have felt the other way in respect to how women are felt within the room. And I think that's something else that we really need to address because it's a two-way okay. two street. Uh, Alison, what do you make of uh, Amanda's comments? Is, is there anything there you, you recognize, you say? Yeah, I totally agree with what you're saying. You know, it's a two-way street, I think. Um, all uh, the discussion that we've been, we've been seeing recently with the Me Too, for example, Me Too campaign, really raise awareness on how women need to be treated in the industry. You know, it's, be, it's been, I mean, I haven't been in the music industry for too long, so it's hard for me to say how it was before and how it's now. But I guess over the past few months, it's, it's nice to see conversation around it. Okay. Completely. And when we're thinking about sort of just general kind of, I hate to use the word low level, but sort of general kind of day-to-day -day sexism, what sorts of examples kind of really annoy you? And if you could say to guys, guys, just stop doing this, please. Is there anything that springs to mind at all? I don't know, it's hard because I, I think I've maybe I've been lucky enough to have to never experience that kind of comments. So, um, no, not really. Maybe it's, um, I've, I've experienced this in a way, in a more passive way where um, guys don't take us seriously as much as, as other women, for example. Mm -hmm. So they would slack on emails, not responding as quickly, for example. But as in like direct comments, I've never experienced it. So I think right. maybe I'm lucky. To that yeah. point, I'd like to mention that in my opinion, most forms of sexism that I've personally experienced and a bunch of other women I've shared stories with was quite subtle um, and invisible and systemic. Mm -hmm. And I think the reason you know um, we are where we are, or the sum of reasons we are where we are, is kind of a 
systemic preconditioned kind of bias mm -hmm. that um, you know goes back years and goes back to education and how we are raised as young uh, women young girls versus young boys you know starting with the whole pink blue thing and being strong but feeling pretty kind of thing it's just like we're in installing this kind of um, bipolar thinking between men and women from a very early age um, and then through to you know more extreme cases I mean go just go over the years there's I think I was re recently reading some stats that young girls actually display interest in STEM education which typically leads to more technical kind of roles uh, later in life um, up until high school and at, like at high school level they drop out and one of the hypotheses was that at that age is when this um, preconditioned, you know, unconscious bias starts displaying, uh, starts, starts becoming visible between teenagers and also starts displaying in one's personality. So that's when like a big thing happens. But then specifically to the music industry, um, you touched on something very interesting there, which is fear. Mm -hmm. And I would love, you know, to, um, redress that as much as possible because this kind of change shouldn't happen because men are scared to interact with us and like you know everyone should be frozen to make sure that they, they've covered their grounds and this, they're not risking anything it's not about that and it's not about us taking over the world it's about us all of us working together uplifting each other regardless of our gender regardless of our sexual identity regardless of our ethnicity and so on as long as we all have the same values, as long as we have, we live our lives both in terms of our careers as well as our personal lives according to some principles that we all agree on and they're positive and it's about empowering each other. Uh, but you know, at the moment we're at a stage where we still have to create awareness and these different segregations exist at, even at an intersectional level. Mm -hmm. We still have a, a lot of work to do. And to Ebony's point as well, it's true, um, there wasn't always, or there isn't always a sense of sisterhood among women either. Uh, just because you're a woman doesn't mean that all of a sudden, you know, you're like part of this movement, which can be tokenistic at times. I mean, it's, it's quite a complex but thing. But in terms of where we are now, I mean, what, what do we think we need, you know, to sort of address the balance and, 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 and address some of these kind of unconscious and subtle issues that we're, we're seeing. I mean, Ebony, what, what do you think of? I would just like to say, like my rule, like just a note for everyone or anyone in the music industry or in any industry, not every woman is an assistant. Like not every woman is there to get your coffee, there to get the thing off the printer. I'm around not so often, like they just assume I am there for their service or another woman is there for their service when that person may be a, a vice president, executive vice president. So my advice would just be to respect everyone because at, you know, when you go to Starbucks, you don't know the title of anyone. Like when, when I go to Starbucks, all I want is a double blended mocha frappuccino. You don't know <laughs> that, you don't know my title. I don't know your title. And your title only matters at your job. Like in the real world, in, in the regular world at Starbucks, they're not asking for your title and determining based on your title or your gender how they should treat you. They're giving you whatever you ask for, the double flip, whatever, whatever. And so I would just suggest to everyone, like, reminder, if it's easier to just think, if, I, if they were at Starbucks, how would I treat them? You would treat them like a normal person. So just because you're in a building or you have a position of power does not make you any closer to heaven than anyone else. So, like, he, so here's the thought, the, the music... <laughs> And you've, you've really hit on something there, which is kind of treating everybody you know, equally. Um, the music industry, this is an observation, has, has been traditionally very hierarchical. Not only has it been very male orientated, but it's been you know, incredibly hierarchical. So when I came into the industry for the first time, you know, there were people like Morris Oberstein and Paul Russell and Rob Dickens and people like that in the UK industry and in the US industry, people like Tommy Mottola, people like Mo Austin and so forth. And all of these guys were kind of worshipped as almost like gods. And then there was a hierarchy below that of executive vice president, senior vice president, vice president, director, et cetera, et cetera. And it was kind of instilled upon you, you know, certainly coming into corporations, which is where I started my career, you know, to be very deferential to those of above you in the, in the career chain. And obviously, yes, you should, it, 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 it felt very know your place. 
Um, how do you sort of re react to that? How do you change all of that sort of thinking and get it to where we need to be for what the industry is now, which seems to be more decentralized, or it seems to be going that way? Andrea, sorry. It, it, it's definitely becoming more decentralized, but we're, we're still far from uh, landing on an ideal scenario here. I think, especially in terms of um, big businesses in the music industry and that those have traditionally been, you know, the record labels, the majors, and the major book agencies, talent agencies. They, st there's, you know, there's still gatekeepers here, and to kind of reframe that because they are, you know, monster companies with a lot of resources, with a lot of employees, and a lot of clients. Um, so still impacting the industry, no matter how many disruptions happen around them. It's, I think, at that level, it, it takes a few changes in policies um, internally, both in terms of HR practices, um, as well as the overall company culture. You know, particularly in the US, the company culture is quite um, focused on the business, not on the, the individual. This is the first thing that I noticed moving from the UK to the US. Mm -hmm. You know, the company has more rights, legally speaking, than the individual. Right. Honestly, and it's to me that's a ridiculous thing. And then you can see that. Be, let's look at Sweden versus the U.S. in terms of parental leave policies, which I believe contribute massively to this gender gap in terms of going up the career ladder in the corporate world specifically. Um, you know, in Sweden you get up to a year and a half of paid leave as a new parent, whereas in the U.S. you get two weeks, two weeks, mind you. And at the end of those two weeks, you're not even guaranteed that you're going to have a job because they're all scared you're going to be a parent and you're not going to be as involved. I just want to bring Ebony in. Sorry, just to no, that. In, in U.S., you get, or maybe in California, I don't know. In U.S., you get, not that it's that much difference, but you get six weeks. And after six weeks, you're right, your job is not guaranteed, but you, have, you get six weeks. It's not the, the, the best. But in all honesty, for me, at four weeks, I was dying to get back to work. Like I was clawing at the walls, so I do I do agree. Like it's great to be all um, you know, baby, baby, baby. But in U.S., we're business. It's work. It's business. So and it, and the work life balance is really supported for me anyway. So it, it is. I would love to spend more time with my kids, but I also love that I had six weeks to get back, like get, to go get my job. Okay. So I yes. think it's two ways. If you're business focused, if you're if you're a career woman. It's, it's helpful to have kind of like a limit, like, all right, love your baby, go to work. So just to clarify for everybody in the room, you've got two children. I do, I have a three-year-old and an eight-year-old. Wow, and you're balancing a very busy career with that. Yes, so uh, when I had my three-year-old, I was literally like breastfeeding and my laptop in the hospital room <laughs> at the same time, and very much like asked to get back, like, to, get back to work. And you wanted that? Yeah. Okay. Well, that's that's the key r right there, you know. Like you, I feel like you should have that option if you want to go back, you know, early in two months or in two weeks or whatever. That can be your option, but you should have the other option as well, whether you're a mother or a father, yeah. mind you. And and another thing that Scusa Braun said yesterday. So he's a parent as well. I think he's got two children. He said children kind of give you a bullshit detector. Do you do you agree with that, Ebony? They are a great excuse to get out of everything. But they also, like, it, they give you no excuse because I, obviously I'm not the only woman in the world with a child. Right. But say I, if I don't want to go somewhere, my baby's sick. She doesn't look, you know, oh, my baby is the reason why I'm late. Like, she's a, they're great, excuse, great excuses to get out of things. But they also definitely make you work harder. And, you know, you want to, you want to work for them. You want to provide that generational wealth. And I'm not, you know, I, that... I was not born with any inheritance or anything like that. So if I want my children to have and my grandchildren to have, I need to go work. Okay. I mean, one of the things I noticed, I think, I think with everybody I, I deal with, but all of you ladies as well, in putting this panel together is how exceptionally hard you all work. And, you know, Andrea, you in particular, you know, we've been trying to get some time to talk to you all week and you've been very elusive because I know you've been kind of on one call, then another, then traveling to one place, then another. Um, it, it feels like, and, and this is what really annoys me, you know, amongst my peer group, so sort of people of my age moaning about 20-somethings, but millennials of being snowflakes or weak or moany or whatever. And I don't seem to see that at all. You all seem to be working, you know, really, really hard. Um, but 
it, it seems you're slightly less masochistic than people who of my generation. You know, there seemed to be this. Um, you know, you had to be at every opening of an envelope. You had to be here, there, and everywhere. You had to know everything about anything. And uh, and these days, I'm seeing people who seem to be working just as hard, but they seem to, it seems to be smarter somehow. And is uh, is that something that you would agree with? Is that something? How do you how do you manage your your crazy schedule, Andrea? Well, it's getting kind of unmanageable, actually. On that note, I should <laughs> revisit <laughs> my plan. Um, but maybe it's also a case of, um, I, again, I was reading some studies recently, and it said that um, there's a new trend in the workplace where uh, the, the freelance life is starting to take over full-time opportunities. So now, around the world, in the music industry and beyond, there are more freelance or short-term jobs available than full-time ones. And that's also a natural kind of progress, because if you look at technology and how things are evolving, you know, certain uh, roles or skills will become a obsolete at some point. So with that comes a lot more flexibility. I mean, Amanda, you two are you're juggling a bunch of stuff. How do you do it? Uh, kinda, I'm like a bit addicted to working. I quite like, <laughs> <laughs> quite like it. Um, how do I do it? I think, so I work at Boiler Room two and a half days as an open dance floors programmer. And I realized that I didn't answer you early when you asked what I did which basically means that I look after the representation and making sure that for Boiler Room we're being as forward thinking as possible. So looking at the LGBTQI scene, BAME representation, women in music, mental health. I'm now looking at knife crime, having had a personal situation happen in relation to all of that. Um, and do management on the side and work with She Said So and have just set up a new small collective of freelance people and freelance women specifically, um, mainly because I found that I was having lots of conversation with freelance women that were finding it very difficult to A, take the leap of faith, know that they're great at what they do, but also finding space and meet other women or they might have roles come towards them, but they're already booked on a job. So how do they keep that and maintain that relationship, the best way to do that is to find somebody else that they know that they can recommend. So bringing women together, um, how do I juggle it? I have a boyfriend that reminds me of my real life, my health, my well-being. I have an amazing 12-year-old sister. I have a godson that's beautiful. And I think it's all those sorts of things. I think the biggest thing that resonated yesterday seeing Scooter talk was how he said about how it's such a privilege to work in the position that we are in and to remember that when we go home that there's a life outside of that. So I generally try to find a best balance. It's not easy and I've definitely been guilty of overworking and burning myself out. But then it's not so bad because then I go for a spa or go for a massage and bring it all back around. Can't afford it. Yeah. <laughs> and Alison, what are, what are your what's your strategy? You know, you have this crazy lifestyle. You know, uh, it's a very demanding role. What you do, you know, how do you stop yourself from falling off the edge of the cliff? Yeah, it's it's not easy because it never stops. You know, nowadays with our cell phones, you get emails, you get messages on like 24 hour clock you know so it, it, you can never really stop it unless you switch off your phone which is like <laughs> then you know you don't know what can happen um no it's it's really difficult i mean i was at a time last year where i was literally working like 16 17 hours i would wake up work and go to sleep with my laptop on my lap and and came to a point where i'm almost burnt out you know it was it was, it was difficult and i had to decide and it's just up to you to make a decision to just switch off and I decided to take off notifications on my phone and would just go check my emails when I mm -hmm. decide to go check my emails. Otherwise it just never stops. You respond to an email and there's another one and there's another one and there's a phone call and it just goes crazy. Okay. So you just have so to So you can go quite, you need to go silent for a, a while and definitely yeah give yourself definitely. some space. Okay. And and leave that like that push notification, just switch it off. Okay. <laughs> that's good. Switch off. And that's what we need to do sort of fairly soon. We're we're coming to the end of the the, the panel, but um, in terms of audience questions, we're going to be doing a sort of a meet the panelists session afterwards. So if you've got any questions and you want to come up and say hello, we're going to be hanging around afterwards around here. So please come up and say hello, meet these um, fabulous people that we've got here today. Um, 45 seconds left. I want to make the most of it. So Ebony, sort of, I'm going to give you the last word here. So just kind of one thing that you just want to say to everybody in the room about the business that we're in now and, and your advice to anybody coming into the industry at this moment. 
Uh, my only advice would be just treat everyone like they're equal and when you have like know know what you're talking about when you have something to say. Don't just speak for the sake of being heard. Like speak when you have something to say. Okay, great. I think we're kind of done. Thank you all so very much. Thanks everybody for coming. <laughs>